Luigi, in the introduction, uh, uh, mentioned that uh, uh, Uber is uh, more of a uh, more of a regu uh, regulation play and not a technology uh, 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 a company. And uh, the question is the, the following. So I would like you to share with us, if you, if you can, how does it, it really work? So when we look from the outside, it looks the following. So you come into the market, okay? I'm not sure that usually the rules are very clear about what you do in the first stages. We'll talk about that. You come into the market, you get the community and the customer excited. Then you start lobbying to make sure that you can operate in this market and not have a, a regulation that the taxi, uh, the taxi company have. And later, when it comes to other issues of labor and so on, you still continue to lobby. So lobbying and regulation is a big issue for Uber. Now I'd like to hear your narrative. Well, so first, we, no, we, are, we are firmly uh, a tech company, right? But we do get uh, embroiled in regulatory discussions. We're kind of probably the leading edge of that. Um, and, you know, the truth is in most parts of the world, the regulations were not black and white as it related to us. In some places they were, and we were prevented from operating. But for the most part, they were gray or unstated. So it's interesting, though, for, for when the company first started, really for its first three years or so, uh, the debate largely was centered around, we've got these old taxi regulations, for hire vehicle regulations, and then we've got Uber and services like it, and how do we fit you into that? And that ended up being a very unsatisfying conversation for everybody. And then Colorado here in the States, California, uh, started to say, okay, we're going to fashion new regulations to allow ride sharing. So what, how's that different? And I think generally, uh, there's a lot of taxi regulations that should be liberalized. Those, those regulations have been on the books for decades, make it easier for them to compete. But at the end of the day, when you've got someone who's just doing this four, six, eight hours a week, they should not go through a four or five month licensing process. Uh, we want to take on as much of the burden as regulation as possible as a company so the drivers aren't having to put out money uh, or time. But what, what's good regulation? So now in the US we've had, uh, I think 75 or 80 new laws passed. We've had new laws in the Philippines, throughout India, throughout Australia, um, throughout Canada, throughout Mexico. What does that mean? It says, okay, from a security standpoint, here's the background checks that should be conducted, here's the insurance requirements, here's the vehicle inspection requirements, here's whatever data requirements we have a city. For instance, in Chicago, we send the city a list of every driver. Here's the fee, so here in Chicago, we pay now 52 cents on every ride. Estimates are Uber and Lyft will pay the city $50 million this year. And that'll continue to grow as we grow. So it's a lot of revenue. So that is, and we actually, so our view is, uh, we believe regulations have a purpose. We understand what we're doing is quite intimate. It's moving people around the city. So the transportation that's being provided, there should be regulations around that. Uh, but we're a tech company and we're not a taxi company. Very, very different um, in, in, in the model. So um, here in the US for the most part, um, the debate has kind of moved beyond the core regulatory discussion and sort of next generation issues. Uh, around labor and some other issues. Um, and that's true in most of the world. I think most of the world has decided that, okay, ride sharing is here to stay. I think more people are understanding there are some public benefit to it. Uh, and what's the best way to handle that? Um, and listen, if you talk, the, the, most of our opposition, it used to come from the insurance industry. Now we're kind of completely in alignment with the insurance industry. But it's still the taxi industry that, I get it, when you had a monopoly, uh, you know, that was a pretty good thing. You want to go back to that. The truth is most of our ridership doesn't come from former taxi. Like, I, you know, I work for Uber. I get Uber credits. I've used taxis three times since I've been in Chicago the last three days. You, I came out of the Sun-Times building going to City Hall. It's easier to ha hail a cab, right? We don't do street hails. We pay more for airports, McCormick Place, Navy Pier, a lot more. We don't have cab ranks. So there's still some advantages that taxis have. But the, they're still trying to suggest that basically Uber and Lyft should be treated like a taxi company. Uh, and pretty much for the most part, most cities have resisted that. Now, and those that didn't, like San Antonio, Texas, passed very onerous regulations. Broward County, Florida, which is a big market for us in Lyft, we pulled out of both of those. Uh, and, you know, they brought forward new regulations because what we do doesn't work if it's a huge barrier to entry for potential drivers. You basically just have a, an app-based taxi company. Uh, and you won't get the kind of coverage you get on the south and west side here in Chicago. You need a lot of drivers to do what we do. So we have over 30,000 drivers, but at any given time, we've only got about 4,000 on the road. So when you've got that many part-time drivers, you just need to have a lot of them uh, to meet the demand. 
So you mentioned the taxis are monopolies, and some monopolies. They used to be. Yeah. Used to be Although a monopoly. Although they still have, they still have, you know, exclusive rights in, in, in certain areas. So some monopolies have to share their rents of monopoly with their labor. What happened to the average wage of taxi drivers in cities that you, Uber uh, has a high market share? Well, we don't have access to the wage data. I think we know that in some places the medallion and license prices have dropped. Uh, and so here in Chicago, 50% of the uh, medallions are owned by Gene Friedman, a taxi oligarch in New York City. Okay, so this is not mom and pop. These are investments. 15 or 50? 50. 50. 5-0. Yeah. Okay. So most of these, now actually Israel's an exception where most of them are owned by individuals, but for the most part. So yes, medallion prices have taken a hit, although most of those appreciated. And there was a big secondary market for it. So in the U.S., for the most part, this debate has been more complicated for us outside the U.S. In the U.S., for the most part, people are like, hey, it's an investment. It goes up and it goes down. Uh, outside of the U.S., there's a little bit more, I think, sensitivity to that. Um, so, but, but at the end of the day, yes, there are, you know, there is, uh, you know, 10, 15 percent, uh, depending on the city, uh, maybe of our rides came out of the taxi market. So there's some competition. But if I, um, if I was advising the taxi, taxi companies, they don't want advice from me, it would be this. Something big is happening out there. So in the next five to seven years, you're going to see a, hugely, a huge number of people leaving their cars at home. They're coming into cities. Oh, we estimate here in the U.S. 50% of our trips are one way. Think about that. They're using us for part of their journey. They're not using us for the rest. So anybody that's in the business of moving people around, public transportation, bike share, car share, taxis, has an opportunity for that. And you're already starting to see some improvement in the taxi service. Right? The radios aren't as loud. Uh, you know, still on the phone too much, but less. The credit card machines work. They're trying, you know, so this is important, right? When you have a monopoly, you never innovate. Uh, and so I think at the end of the day, and don't forget, taxi drivers now, if, if that's what they do for a living, they can also drive in our platform. So before they had one choice, pay about $150 to a medallion owner. Think about that. So you're in the hole 150 before you get in the car. Work a set schedule. Unlike us, you got to work 10, 12 hours a day, um, and you didn't have any option. Now you can drive for Uber, Lyft, Amazon Prime Now, Instacart, any of these. Many of our drivers, they'll turn on their app to work. Uber, Lyft, couple delivery services. So, you know, it's not exclusive. Whoever's got a job for them at the moment, they accept it. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think that, you know, the taxi industry is not going to go away. They've got to continue to innovate and figure out, okay, as more people aren't coming into cities using their cars, how do we compete for that? And they do have some strengths. There's many, many use cases where it's easier to get a taxi than it is an Uber or Lyft. And they need to figure out how to really maximize that advantage. So you have a few new novel and innovative ideas how you uh, lobby with uh, the local uh, lawmakers in the cities uh, where you have trouble with uh, 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 with the taxi drivers and so on. Can you tell us what you're doing right now as we speak in Austin? I heard that it's, uh, there is a fierce battle going on in Austin, Texas. Right, so, so Austin, Texas, where again, they had, like Chicago, kind of great regulations. It's booming. Both Uber and Lyft are doing really well down there. Um, DUI reductions, law enforcement, ha say, has been cut drastically. Um, but, you know, the taxi industry got some of their allies on the city council there to pass basically regulations that would turn us into a taxi company. So in Austin, you were, we were allowed to put a different ordinance on a ballot, so there's a special election on May 7th, which, you know, I think will be hard for us to win, but we're trying. Um, and if we don't win, uh, we're probably going to have to suspend operations in Austin because we just can't build a ride-sharing product. So here, but here's what's interesting. If we're successful in Austin, like everywhere, it's because of our riders and drivers. So I was involved in politics, uh, managed the Obama campaign in 08, which was probably the best mer marriage of technology and grassroots we've ever seen in political history, okay? Uber is a company. What's fascinating is our Activision rivals that. So if we ask our riders and drivers to uh, post a message on Facebook, get on Twitter, attend a rally, contact an elected official, they do it. No other that I am aware of, nobody right now has that kind of activism. Why is it? Because it's become really important to people. Like, I'm making money. If that goes away, that matters to me. I use this now to get around my city. I live on the south side. My life's been changed because I can get around. If you take that away, my life's going to be materially harmed in a negative way. So that has been our secret recipe, is that um, 
we have, in most of our legislative debates that we've had in regulatory issues, um, we can press a button and have tens of thousands of people get active. So here in Chicago, we have the city councils trying to do some, or one of the city council, uh, the, one of the aldermen is trying to do some rear guard actions. That would make it a lot harder for people to sign up on the platform. We had 100,000 people sign a petition in a matter of a couple days. People feel passionately about this. So I think um, our success has been not really in the back rooms. It's been out in the public. So in Austin, if we're successful, it will be because enough of our riders and drivers turned into special election voters. Uh, that's how we win that. All right. So uh, uh, can you give us a global look now where you are allowed to operate? Like I descend in Germany, there are a few problems. In Paris, in France, some countries that right. you are. So can you share with us how does it work with regulation in the United States right. and then in Europe? So we're in 70 countries now. The latest one was Pakistan about three weeks ago. Uh, we're in Lahore. And as it turns out, the notion that press a button and get a ride or press a button and get work works everywhere. Doesn't matter the country or the continent or real, really even the size of the city. So we're operating everywhere. The question is in what fashion? So I would say in the United States, uh, in Mexico, um, in some parts of Latin America, uh, in a few Canadian cities, in Australia, in the UK, some of the Eastern European countries, Africa, basically we're able to, you know, off offer the service we want to offer. You've got UberX, and it's fairly easy for people to get on the platform. You've got Uber Black, where that's uh, an interesting product. We've got Uberpool now, our carpooling product in many Chinese and Indian cities. Our business is just booming in India. So I think where we've had the biggest issues are in sort of southern Europe. Um, we'll talk about Israel, I'm sure. So in France, we actually have a great business. Got over 10,000 drivers. But what we had there was called Uber Pop, which is the equivalent of the American UberX. And we had to temporarily shut that down uh, and had thousands and thousands of people lose their livelihood. Um, and so that's what we're fighting for, is to liberalize that market. So in France, by the way, it takes 240 hours to be a taxi driver or an Uber driver. Think about that. It takes 120 hours in France to become an airline pilot. Right? It, in, in London, it, you, you know, a black cabbie has to take a, a knowledge test that takes three years, which will probably be reformed. So part of this is changing the overall regulatory structure. Um, and so in Europe, I think the issues are taxi unions are very strong. And the notion of somebody having a job and then going out for five hours and making money on the side uh, is not as easily digested there as it is in other parts of the world. Um, so we're making progress. I think, you know, the European Commission, I think, is looking into this very intensively. This is supposed to be one single digital market we're operating in, not 28 different situations. And somewhere, so in Germany, uh, you know, we have kind of a licensed product, very much like a taxi product. Uh, you know, it's not really scaled to the degree we've seen in other parts of the, the world. Uh, on the other hand, like Eastern Europe, I was with um, the Estonian Prime Minister recently, and you know they're embracing what we're doing um, remarkably. They see it as you know they want to go to a completely paperless society. Um, so we're working with them to make sure that every transaction gets directed into the government. And Estonia, people don't even do taxes; the government does it for them, right? And so part of this is is um, uh, I think is politics. There's no question about that. Um, the taxi unions are stronger in Europe, but the model works everywhere. So our biggest cities now in Uber are not in the U.S., they're in China. You know, Mexico City has been one of our fastest growing cities over the last six months. Um, we're growing um, very, very strongly all throughout India. So the model works everywhere. And I think for the most part, our conversations with the regulators are not now, well, should Uber exist or not? And again, when I say Uber, we have competitors in almost every market we're in, many of them local. Or what's the right way to do it? And what's interesting is there's now all sorts of examples around the world about regulatory uh, solutions. So this is not complicated. It's not rocket science. Governments all over the world have passed new ride-sharing laws. Um, what's really complicated is the politics of it, right? And the taxi industry will tell elected officials, you're making a choice between ride-sharing and taxi. Uh, and that's not what you're doing. You're largely enabling a new market. Yes, there's going to be some competition for taxi. Um, and every country in the world, I mean, what's interesting, in China, our drivers uh, very much resemble the United States. Heavily part-time, most of them under 10 hours, but even more so than the U.S., they skew almost exclusively middle class. So even in China, with the wage growth you've had, you've had a lot of people out there. They have a car, they've got a home, but they're still pressed economically. So you have drivers coming on the platform for six, eight, ten hours a week uh, to drive. In Mexico City, it tends to be more full-time drivers. 
but 50% of our drivers in Mexico City prior to driving on the Uber platform were unemployed, which is why the mayor down there took such a, you know, the politics were hard. In Mexico City, taxi drivers were taking out our drivers and our riders and beating them, okay? They were trying to shut down the city, but the mayor said, listen, I got high unemployment, I got massive congestion, I think this could help, and he's done it, and so he deserves credit because those drivers that are now making income who were unemployed, it's all because he set forth a regulatory pathway to allow that to happen. You mentioned India and China. Some analysts believe that it will be very impossible to you to win those markets as they are uh, strong local competitors that maybe are more politically connected than you. And you're still losing a boatload of money, especially in China. Well, for, you know, so, so in India we have a competitor called Ola that, that generally does what we do. Um, we're gaining very quickly. I mean, we're, we're the market leader in a bunch of cities right behind another. So, and, you know, that's going well. But, you know, there's going to, like here, you know, Ola's a strong business. And um, like here, a lot of drivers drive for both Uber and Ola. But India's going very, very well. But what we do is there's no, there's no daylight. So, you know, the government is not going to be able to somehow through arbitrage say, we're cool with what Ola does, not with what Uber does. In China, we have a competitor called Didi Quadi. Um, they started with a taxi service, but um, we also now, both of us do private hire vehicles. Um, and again, many drivers drive for both. Um, that's a place where we are investing a lot. Um, you know, our CEOs uh, talked about how much we're spending there. But even though we're the number two player, we're gaining market share. But as I said, Uber's biggest cities in the world are in China. Seven of our top cities are in China. So even though we're number two, it's a heck of a business uh, with a lot of potential. Um, so at the end of the day, I think what's, what you're seeing in China is you've got an emissions crisis, you've got a congestion crisis, and you've got need for more money. And I think the government understands that ride sharing plays an important role there. Um, so, you know, we always have to be on our toes and mindful. But I don't think you're going to see a situation where a domestic competitor is favored because what we do, uh, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of distinction in terms of our technology and our mapping. And, but the, the core notion of press a button and get a ride from a private vehicle uh, is the same. Okay, so in the United States you are clearly the leader and one of the smarter things you were able to achieve is that you are associated with the sharing, with the terminology of sharing economy. But when we uh, uh, teach case studies about Uber here in Booth, we don't talk about sharing economy, we talk about network effects and we talk about platforms and as we know, uh, Companies like Uber that are working as uh, digital platforms tend to be in industries that go into winner-take-all. So how can you call yourself a sharing economy company while at the end of the day we know that those markets tend to monopolize and at the end of the day you will be controlling the market and not the users and not the drivers? Well, again, call it sharing economy, call it on-demand economy. Um, uh, no, wh what our growth comes from people using their own personal vehicle. You know, they have a Ford Fusion and Toyota Prius, uh, and they're leveraging that to make additional money. W the way a lot of our drivers say it is, you know, I turn my paycheck from Uber into the way I pay for my car, right? And so at the end of the day, I think that that is, I think, um, and particularly when you look at Uber Pool, so one person using their own personal car to offer rides to multiple people going in the same direction. Um, if that's not sharing, I don't know what is. But at the end of the day, um, listen, we're going to have healthy competition from people like Ola, Didi, and Lyft here in the U.S., but also, as you mentioned, there's women-only options, there's children options, there are different on-demand. People are going to try many different offshoots of this. Uh, and, you know, that keeps us on our toes. We have to, you know, we have to continually have enough drivers on the system. We obviously want to continue to boost demand on the rider side. Uh, and so this has to be an attractive, of, for people who are doing this for supplemental income, if it's not, if the, if, first of all, if it's not enough money, they're not going to do it. If they don't feel safe, they're not going to do it. Uh, and if the tech's not a good experience, they're not going to do it. So at the end of the day, uh, they vote with their behavior. Uh, and I think what you see is the way a lot of people tell us, they'll say, listen, I, I need more money. I've got a job. I need more money. I really don't want to do a restaurant or retail just because of the inflexibility. And in some cases, on-demand scheduling where they've got no control. This works for me. Okay? Now, if it's just flexible and the income's not great, they're obviously not going to do it. Uh, and so our goal is, um, and that's why there's a, a, an, an interesting discussion. When we cut prices, people, it's counterintuitive. Well, if you cut prices, 
how can that be good for the drivers? Well, if the driver went out for three hours and was doing nine trips in three hours, and now they're doing 11 trips or 12 trips, they're making more money. So our goal is if you turn on the app to have you 75, 80, 85, 90% of the time utilized. Now, we don't know what's happening on the Lyft platform here in Chicago. You may do three Uber trips in an hour and one Lyft trip. We don't have visibility into that. But when you're on our platform, our goal is to basically have you be on a perpetual trip uh, so that you're more fully utilized. Uh, and so again, um, uh, I, I think there's going to be competition in this space. Our competition is competitors like Lyft here in the US. It's personal car use. That's kind of where we see. We'd like you to make your decision if you're going to the movies uh, or you're going to meet friends for dinner uh, or you're going to uh, the L or you're going to the airport. Instead of driving the car, use Uber. That's where our growth is going to come from. Okay, and still, if you are using the words uh, sharing economy, why is it that you fight a uh, tooth and nail with uh, the dri your drivers in California that want to unionize? Well, we're not fighting tooth and nail. A few drivers signed up with a plaintiff's attorney. Okay, So let's be clear about that. I spend a lot of time, as all of us do in the company with our drivers, uh, the debate about classification is not a conversation I've had uh, more than two or three times. Okay, what they're focused on is, is the app working, is the payment system working, you know, is it busy enough? So first of all, this is one where Lyft, actually our competitor, had a similar lawsuit and has now settled it, being reviewed by the judge that codifies their independent contractor status. So listen, our drivers like the flexibility. What's the most important is they control the schedule. Okay? So if you're an employee, obviously you're going to set the schedule. I've been an employee many times in my life and currently now. I work when I'm told to work, essentially, right, as everyone is. So a lot of people would lose the opportunity. Um, let's just talk about the taxi industry. 95% of taxi drivers in the United States of America and all the taxi drivers in Chicago are independent contractors. It's not like this is a different model, but those people don't use their own car. They pay fairly usurious rates every day. They have no schedule flexibility. Okay? So at the end of the day, we're very confident in the business model from a classification standpoint. You know, I think there are interesting debates around, well, what if 10 years from now you have a higher percentage than you have now people working in the so-called gig economy? Um, you know, there's an important paper out recently from Alan Kruger and some of his colleagues that stated that, first of all, the number of people working in the quote-unquote gig economy is much smaller than people t realize, but most of them are not app-based. It's realtors and construction <coughs> and emergency room doctors and financial planners. There's always been a contingent workforce. So at the end of the day, I think, but if, if 10 years from now, more and more people are getting their money from a collection of so-called gigs, then you're going to have to look at the way we do benefits in this country. There's no question about that. But right now, I think there's some acceleration of this trend. I talked to some elected officials who say, well, listen, the problem is everyone out there is lifting and Ubering and task rabbiting and Instacarting and airbnb -ing. That person doesn't exist, OK? It doesn't exist. What we see in our research is people who drive on the Uber platform, the only other thing they're doing might be driving for Lyft. They have a core what we consider traditional job. So I think it's it's interesting question for policymakers. But, but right now, um, I think in our driver population, um, they think the model works. They want control of time, control of their money. Uh, and if you become employees, obviously, you're going to lose all that. But again, the limo model, the taxi model, uh, has traditionally been one where it's independent contractors um, who are applying their way. They're, they're, they're micro-entrepreneurs. David, you were involved in politics, and maybe you are still involved in politics. I saw that you endorsed uh, uh, Hillary, uh, Hillary uh, uh, Clinton. And going back to what you just uh, uh, said about uh, how does the economy and the labor market going to look in 10 years, so what is your recipe for it? What kind of uh, labor market are we going to have in the United States, and specifically, how does uh, uh, companies like Uber fit into the model of the kind of right. labor market you want to see? Right. So let's have a normative discussion now and not descriptive as we see now what's happening in the labor market. Well, I'm not an economist, right? I will, um, uh, I'm not a lawyer, either, but I occasionally practice them on TV, so I'll, I'll talk about it. I think we all wish that sometime in the next decade, most what we consider traditional jobs will start having wage increases of 4, 5, 6% a year. Uh, I have never talked to an economist who says they think that's the case. So what I think you're looking at where, where platforms like Uber and Airbnb come in is, um, you know, I don't, my suspicion is 10 years from now, 
You're not going to have a vast shift to people working so-called gigs or in the on-demand economy. Most people are still going to have what we consider traditional jobs, but we're still going to have the situation we have today, which is many people dissatisfied with the income from that traditional job. So platforms like ours are something people can use on their own terms to add to that. And I think that's where we come in. Um, and that's where the, 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 the trajectory here is every month in the United States, the number of hours driven per month by our drivers drops. Why? Because more people are coming on, not doing it even 25 hours a week. They're just doing it a few. We have a remarkably high number of drivers in the U.S. that only do two or three trips a month. We don't even count them in our active driver number. They're literally just saying, I want to just go make 40 or 50 bucks. Think about that. So our suspicion is, and our hope is in another two or three years, here in Chicago, um, pretty much anybody that turns on a car or a phone will decide, I want to see if I could pick somebody up on my way to work, on my way to a social event, and make a little money, and give somebody a ride on the process. So that's where this goes, I think, is I don't think you're saying, well, there's, there's kind of the Uber model, Airbnb model, and that's a choice between traditional. I think we are increasingly in augmentation here in the United States and in many countries to traditional work. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, um, when we talk to our drivers, I mean, it is life-changing to say, basically, my spouse and I had a job, right? Um, you know, let's say, uh, live in the Denver, Colorado suburbs. We make between us 55000 a year. Hasn't really changed. Don't see that changing much. Now, one of us uses a platform like this, and we go 55 to 65. That extra money is, li is life-changing to them. It's an extra degree of security. It gives them a cushion. Again, it might even allow them to take a vacation. And so that's where I think we come in. I don't think this is a choice uh, where you know, some people say, well, we have to decide, is this the future of work? Are models like this the future of work? Uh, I think we are going to increasingly accelerate um, here in the driver population being augmenting what we would consider more traditional income. And some of that is in a sustained way. Some of it's episodically. We have a huge increase of drivers around the holidays. Why? That's how they pay for holidays. That's how they pay for travel. And by the way, we may not see them again for 12 months after that. A lot of students drive with us in the summer. Uh, you know, if there's big events, the Final Four or Super Bowl, you'll see a bunch of drivers come on the platform because they know it'll be, they'll be really busy, make a bunch of money. We may not see them again. So I, I don't think this is a choice between this model and the old model. I think our model is basically going to help people who are engaged in what we'd consider traditional employment have more economic security. Okay. By the so way, if that was a government program, um, you know, there'd be parades thrown for it. All right. <laughs> Let's see about that. So <laughs> uh, we'll t I, I have a few questions to you about politics, but before that, let's uh, continue on and uh, get some questions on Uber. So, uh, so we have two mics here. So uh, yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, hi, my name is Allison, and I'm a dual degree MBA and master's in public policy student here. Um, Uber has a reputation for being adversarial with regulators, and we've talked a lot about regulating, regulation um, and the work of regulators uh, tonight. But in comparison to someone like Airbnb, which has a reputation of being uh, very conciliatory and very much trying to work with regulators, um, and as a former government official, how do you justify the attitude of, you know, we're going to mobilize our drivers, mobilize our riders, have petitions to change the regulations in our favor from an external perspective in contrast to working directly with the regulators to make it work for everybody? Well, uh, you know, our, our colleagues at Airbnb certainly have a more gentle reputation, but they're having many issues themselves. And listen, what we do is grittier. It's in your face. You've got taxi drivers on the streets, okay? Much different. In the hotel industry, they're starting to get organized, not as organized. So listen, I worked in government. I, when I was in the White House, um, an effort led by Cass Stunstein, President Obama said, you know what, I, wanna, I want us to review every regulation on the book. By the way, scary thing is that hadn't happened in decades. He did that for two reasons. One is to show most of the regulations serve a good purpose, but he also wanted to say if ones don't make sense, since we believe regulations have an important, we should be the first ones to raise our hands and say when regulations have outlived their usefulness or are no longer fit for purpose. And guess what we found? hundreds and thousands of regulations sitting on the federal books that were serving no purpose, that were costing businesses money, okay? So from a regulatory standpoint, listen, if, if we said, you know what, and again, most of the laws were not black and white. Some were, 
Las Vegas was black and white. Portland, Oregon was black and white. But for the most part here in the US, it was gray. The transportation regulations didn't envision GPS smartphones or an average person deciding to drive their Fusion for four hours. It envisioned full-time people in a four higher standing. We'd still be waiting. We'd still be waiting, okay? So at the end of the day, yeah, we have been, and I think we've learned, so we're, I think, much more, most of the conversations I have with government in the US today are not about regulation. It's like, how can we help with job training? How can we help with some of your transportation challenges? Uh, we've signed MOUs all over the world with governments. Uh, we're on the uh, federal government website in India, by the way, as a, an example of an entrepreneurial opportunity. So, you know, that's kind of, some of that's old Uber, but there's no doubt that when you're in, in, in conversation with government, um, you know, there's gonna be some tension there. And regulators are gonna say, listen, this ought to be done quietly in a back room. And when the discussion two years ago was really about old taxi regulations, new technology-based service, there's a collision. Now the debate in the US has really evolved where most people understand that's not really a, a very satisfying debate and they're fashioning new regulations. So at the end of the day, um, I look at the output and from a progressive standpoint, the things I fought for my whole life, making uh, transportation more equal, giving people more opportunity, dialing up more income for people in a way that works for their family, um, these are very important things. And again, from a governmental standpoint, you know, I've talked to the smartest economists in the world and I've yet heard anybody say, you know booth. what? Of course in Booth, <laughs> who said, you know what, we're just a couple years away from basically everybody getting the wage growth they need. We gotta live in the real world. And the real world is people out there are hurting, or if they're not hurting, they like a little bit more money, more in an aspirational sense. And that's where I think this comes in. So, um, uh, so I, I think we have a much more cooperative uh, relationship with governments now, but we're still gonna have some tension, as any company does. Um, but, um, and you know, I think we've been the leading edge of a lot of this, so a lot of companies have been able to kind of tuck behind us um, because we're the biggest player and, the, and had been the most controversial player. I interviewed uh, many, many people, and I don't remember when I was looking all the time to see where is this teleprompter that you're reading from, <laughs> and there is none here. So this is very natural to you. Dave, thank you very well, much. Guys, thank <laughs> you. Thanks, everybody. Great, uh, <laughs> great questions. Yeah, but you were great in asking. Yeah. No, no.